going to start by just doing a very short reading, um, which is the beginning of the chapter, The Snatchers, which is about the harpies. The harpies were especially foul, even as grotesqueries go. Virgil writes in the Aeneid, no monster is more malevolent than these. No scourge of gods or pestilence more savage ever rose from the Stygian waves. The creatures are mostly bird with the faces of women. Like many creatures of myth, their monstrousness comes in part from being two things at once. And like many female monsters, it comes specifically from the fact that they are both a woman and something else, something that horrifies simply because its girl face is a misleading trap. A whole lot of monsters, both in Greek antiquity and in other traditions, can be summed up as, what a pretty lady, now to take a big sip of my coffee and look at the rest of her body. But the horror of the harpies goes beyond their hybridity. These birds may wear the faces of virgins, but their bellies drip with disgusting discharge and their hands are talons and their features pale and famished, writes Virgil. That's the Alan Mandelbaum translation. John Dryden's translation says they have virgin faces, but with wombs obscene, which probably says more about Dryden than anything else. Beyond that physical grossness though, the harpies are defined by their thieving nature. It's right there in the name, which is from the Greek for snatcher. In Homer, they're not even bird women yet, but they're already thieves, storm spirits who carry people off unawares. But the defining story of the harpies is the one canonized in the journey of the Argonauts, in which the vile creatures are sent to torment King Phineas of Thrace. Anytime Phineas is served food, the creatures swoop down and claw it away either devouring it or rendering it inedible with their disgusting smell. They are ravenous, but their appetite isn't just for food. What they can't eat, they are content to merely destroy. The important thing is that their target goes hungry. Phineas and the quest for the Golden Fleece is not the last we hear of the harpies. In the Aeneid, the harpies are no longer tormenting Phineas, but hanging out on an island where Aeneas and his crew make landfall. Aeneas, narrating, fondly recalls discovering cows and goats wandering unguarded. The crew kills as many of the cattle as they want to eat and a few more to share with the gods. But then the harpies swoop in. Aeneas and his men are incensed by this foul attack on their rightfully stolen property. Hopped up on vengeance, they chase down the harpies, hacking fruitlessly at the creature's blade-proof skin with their swords. It does not occur to Aeneas and his men to wonder about the ownership of the meal they're fighting to defend. But in fact, the harpy Selino says, the slaughtered cattle belonged to her and her sisters. The island where the crew was making merry, feasting on their stolen cows, was the kingdom of the harpy's father. The sailors were the interlopers. The monsters were there by right. The harpies weren't spoiling Aeneas's feast for fun, or as in the case of Phineas at the behest of the gods. They had come not to perpetrate a theft, but to avenge it. And yet it makes no difference in the end that the men were trespassers and thieves, that the harpies belonged on the island and owned the cattle. As soon as the ship touched down, as soon as the men spied turf they could rest on and meat they could chase down, any woman's attempt to snatch it back became a monstrous overreach. A man who lays claim to unguarded property is a hero, a woman who grasps for her share is an abomination. This is why calling a woman a harpy is more barbed than calling her a bitch. A harpy is vicious and disgusting, yes, but she's more than that. She's someone who grabs for what doesn't belong to her, even if, as with the cows in the Aeneid, it does. To call a woman a harpy is both to deride her ambition and to reinforce the idea that she deserves nothing, that everything she's ever earned has been stolen from the mouths of men to whom it truly belonged. It's a term especially weaponized against women who seek advancement in male-dominated fields like politics, and no surprise. If Hillary Clinton or, or Elizabeth Warren is a harpy, and both have been called a harpy many times, both sincerely in right-wing media and acerbically in Wonkette. That's not only because she's vicious and shrill, but because she viciously and shrilly seeks to rise above her station. She aspires to a role that's not meant for her, a position she can only steal, not earn. Though the harpies descend on Phineas's food like wild animals, they are not wild animals. A vulture that scavenged or befouled food would not be monstrous, Feral creatures eat what they can, where they can and shit where they must. There are two things that make the harpy a monster, not a beast. Her single-minded focus on depriving others and her human female face. Wow, thank you, Jess. <laughs> that was one of my favorite passages from the book. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Helen. I'm so excited to be here with Jess and to celebrate this just like 
phenomenal collection of essays. Um, I hope all of you who are out there either already have your copies or have placed your orders like yesterday because you need to read this immediately. Um, oh my gosh, I'm like fangirling out about you. I text you 20 times a day, like 300 times a day. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm talking to Jess on Zoom in front of an audience. This is so exciting for me. Um, I, I love that you read that particular passage actually. And it set me up so beautifully to make this all about me. Um, one of the questions that I wanted to ask you is actually directly tied to, to some of what you read. And I'm gonna reorganize all of my beautifully flowed logical sequence of things that I wanted to talk to you about to pull that one right up to the top. Um, one of the things that I love throughout this book and, and that I noticed is sort of a repeated motif is that you, very frequently kind of go to the text. You cite classical scholars, you cite, you know, Virgil and Ovid and, and all of the sort of greats who created these myths. And you frequently kind of compare the ways that these monsters have been codified, you know, in various primary sources or, you know, oral traditions. And then also do this second order comparison of the ways that those original tellings are translated. Um, and one of my favorite beats happens here when you we have these comparing translations of like what it is that the harpies look like and like really does say more about Dryden than anything else that he describes them as what was the phrase savage wombs wombs <laughs> obscene um, yeah. um and I maybe it's a maybe it's a little bit of a, a weird place to start but I would really love to to know about the process of kind of going to those sources and working with these in many cases deeply ancient um archetypes of monsters and, and you know hundreds and hundreds of years separating the times that people have have put these stories down and the various translators bringing their own things to the page and then you kind of laying your own you know palimpsest layer on top of everything else like what how how was that process for you do you sort of view yourself in dialogue with that big history um I, not really because like to me I think it was really important to kind of let to like recognize that like I'm not a classicist uh, and to kind of like let go of the um the instinct that I had at the beginning which was like oh I have to really like understand all of these things in context give me a second I'm going to turn off my heater which I should have done before cool well Jess is doing that I have a surprise for everybody else which is um that like four or five years ago I bought these for Jess as a gift and I never gave them to her <laughs> because I'm a terrible friend. I still love them. <laughs> um, this is, how do you even say her name, Skilla? I, so it's it's Skilla, and here's the thing. So one of the things I was gonna say is I do have a friend who's a classicist who <laughs> has like built a lot of questions for me over the course of the book. Like I would I would sort of trace down, you know, there, there would be like a particular thing that I was like, okay, I, I can see that people are translating this this way, but I have no idea what it actually means in the original. And then I could just be like, Joe, please, please explain this to me. And so the other day, after I had done several podcasts, so like definitely late, I was like, Joe, can you please just write down for me how to say every monster that has ever appeared from Greek mythology? Um, and fortunately, any surprises. Um, well, we we went back and forth a little bit about Lamia. We decided that it was supposed to be Lamia, um, but the only like. The only surprise was that he said, there's not really a right answer. There's only sort of tradition. There's things mm -hmm. that people, you know, like, and he said, I, I, mispron I mispronounced Cicero, but everybody knows what I mean when I say Cicero, but it should be kick arrow. Um, so, so kind of just do your best. And so that was, <laughs> <laughs> that actually goes back to, to what I was, what I was starting with, um, with answering your question, which is kind of releasing myself from the, the obligation to, to be a really like deep level expert on all of these texts and have read every you know translation of every part um because I did sort of start with that instinct that like oh I can't even get started on this until I am you know entirely up on kind of the original source classical mythology um and but the truth is that like what I'm interested in is the ways that these stories persist um which in some cases is the ways that they've changed. Um, and that to me is what's interesting about translation, right? Is that there is that kind of mediation of another person, often another man, right? Usually another man um, coming in and sort of adding another level 
of palimpsest, as you said. Um, and so, so it was it was important to me to sort of go back to where the stories came from. Um, but what I'm interested in more than anything is kind of the the arc that they've made, sort of through the history of sort of of what we think of as Western culture um, and the ways that that they've kind of bounced off us, you know, and 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 ricocheted around um, and. Sometimes it's very interesting if, if there's a story that has come to you in a particular way. Sometimes it's more interesting to go back to original sources and say, oh, wow, you know, this is like your idea of the harpies. If you have just kind of a vague idea of what harpies do, you, you probably don't remember that there is this part in the Aeneid where like actually they are, they're just trying to defend what they already rightfully own, right? So it can be very interesting to kind of go back to the original um, stories to find sort of a new thing to focus on. Um, but uh, but I definitely would not like <laughs> someone asked me just a couple of days ago, like what, what, what would you say is the best source for um, for reading about the Roman versions of the Greek gods? And I was like, oh no, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I only know the part of the research that I've already done. Like I'm not, <laughs> I don't know it comprehensively. You know, I mean, like you, I grew up being really obsessive about Dallaire's Greek myths, which, um, um, like, you know, shout outs in, 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 please mention in the chat, by the way, if you're a Dallaire's Greek myth stan, because I think that like all those of us who had that obsessiveness as a child do have a common language, like we will all love each other, because yeah. we all really heavily imprinted on that particular illustration style, especially. Um, and yeah, I of the stories also like it's it can be very weird to to kind of then go to the actual stories and be like oh this is this was really hanged <laughs> for me i know they were on some shit and they like they wrote other cultures mythologies too apparently like there's a whole dolaire's family yeah i had the norse like, one but i didn't like it as much okay that's yeah <laughs> yeah and then like i remember finding out that the romans basically you know lifted all of these folks wholesale and i felt deeply affronted like it says Greek myths right on the book cover. And then and they have, if I recall correctly, they had like a two page spread that showed you the Pantheon and then it showed you like their Greek name and then their Roman name. Um, because actually I remember that my my best friend at the time, which at the time is like, can, I didn't go to kindergarten, but at the time is like preschool and first grade. Um, that we thought it was the funniest fucking thing that Apollo had the same yes! name. <laughs> oh my god I was so obsessed with that because all of them had different it was like Hera and Rhea and Diana yeah. and Artemis and then Apollo Apollo and it was like what? this was our idea of a very good joke but I also felt really affronted by it because they like you spent this whole book like learning about them under their Greek names and then here's this two-page like illustration that is just like oh and also the Romans had the exact same guys but they just rebranded them like <laughs> Classic Romans, Romans on brand for them. <laughs> well, so in terms of the monsters and the the use of them as a device for exploring all of these topics that you explore, um, I know that that many of the essays in the book began their life as part of a series that you wrote for Catapult. Um, but I'm curious how from a, a process perspective, but also sort of from a conceptualizing perspective, if the monsters came first, or if there was a theme that you knew you wanted to explore, and then you found the monster had the right attribute to go with it, or, or was it sort of a hall of mirrors? Um, oh, in terms of sort of assigning, I mean, I did think of each monster in the book as kind of having um, having a specific trait and, and for a while actually the, the chapters now have sort of their own different names but for a while they were just named for the traits um, and that was more that I wanted to write about monsters I felt that there was something kind of metaphorically robust in writing about mythological monsters and then I I did sit down and kind of make a list of all of the ones that I could think of and and sort of said okay what what what's the function of it like what how is this story functioning in our culture um, or like, you know, how can I make it function, right? How can I use this as, as kind of an extended metaphor and how can I use it to, to highlight a specific trait? Um, so, um, you know, so some, some of them that took longer um, than others, like some of, some of them it's very obvious to me, you know, the Furies 
to have to connect the furious to anger like that's kind of right there in the name <laughs> and then other ones it was a little bit a little bit less obvious but yeah I definitely like sat down with a list of like here's monsters on one side and here's traits on the other side and then just like the world gave you things to beautifully or passionately or angrily write about which is the sort of perverse gift of the personal essay <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I definitely spent, you know, like the, I guess, 18 months that I was writing it, I was definitely like sort of, oh, you know, and now we've had the Brett Kavanaugh nomination, and I can fold that in. And now we've had, you know, um, Trump talking shit about Megan Rapinoe, and I can kind of fold that in. It's mostly not sort of current events, but it, but it is, um, it was a good reminder that, you know, even in dealing with these kind of ancient stories, that they'll keep being relevant. Um, well, one of the things I found really moving was that, you know, you draw these very intimate portraits of the monsters. You, you know, you give them, I think, a degree of dimensionality and interiority and desire and despair that they are almost never given unless you're in like a Muriel Reichweiser poem. And um, the, and that, that immediacy to me felt really beautifully framed against those intensely contemporary like current events feeling moments like there were a couple of, of moments in the book where you mentioned COVID-19 and things like Brett Kavanaugh and Trump and Megan Rapinoe which for those of you who haven't read the book yet it's not everywhere in it it's it's very carefully titrated doses but it they're, they're these jolts of reality in a in a context both I think like the essay collection the sort of world of broad feminist writing the universe of mythology that tends to not be super concretized and then it's just like hey motherfucker like this is real like these are real people these are real things and and like part of that was just you know you got to keep it fun for yourself so you have to kind of mix it up um and have you know if it had been all mythology like that i think it would have been in many ways beyond me because again like i'm not a classicist um, and if it had been all personal, I think that would have been boring for me. If it had been all current events, I don't think that would have been much fun. Um, but I think this is one of those cases, and this is something you and I talk about a lot, is like doing, writing things for yourself versus writing things for the reader. This, I think, is one of those cases where writing things that keep you interested are also then the things that are generous to the reader and you give them like a little bit of ability to, to like take a break conceptually, move on to a different thing and then and then move back. Um, but then also part of it is that, you know, really one of the animating concepts here is that stories are important and stories are reality. Um, and the ways that we think about things and talk about things influence the way that we experience them. And so, you know, even though these are very, very ancient stories, um, because they've influenced kind of what we think of as Western culture and because Western culture has kind of just, you know, um, exerted so much power and, and um, I mean, I'm shying away from saying violence, but I don't know why, um, power and violence over other cultures, um, that, that like these stories really have dictated what the ways that we that we tell stories right you know the all of all of these you know you need to you need to like have read Ovid in order to understand renaissance literature and in order to, under, to understand renaissance art and then often you need to have read renaissance literature in order to understand like the next wave of things that that take renaissance literature as their kind of um rubric for what counts as literary quality um, and that sort of keeps on rolling forward. And so I think that, I think it makes a lot of sense to kind of draw direct connections between these stories and what is happening in real life. I was having a conversation with a friend the other day about the monomyth and the sort of structure of the monomyth and the whole kind of Joseph Campbell, you know, men in the forest banging drums kind of thing. And, um, and he was, it, the conversation was with a man and he was telling me you know, just a lovely kind of drunk people having a, lit, a light lit crit conversation he was talking about how the core of the monomyth is about the relationship between fathers and sons and I was like well then it can't be the monomyth because there's a lot of people who aren't fathers and aren't sons and it was just you know this this whole kind of you know infinite walls crashing against walls kind of conversation and it it does seem to me that 
so much of the work of this and of kind of repositioning villains as heroes is mm -hmm. frequently the work of a lot of these kind of feminist or feminist leaning reclamations and sort of literary recontextualizations of stories that have had at their center like men who move through their world without regard for the people that they interact with or kill or like you know cut the head off of producing pegasus from her dead body or whatever it might be and then here is this story that is universal i mean in many ways the stories of all of these monsters are the same story mm -hmm. um but but you know the attributes of their monstrosity you know, or the many faces of woman or whatever we want to put on. <laughs> right, so it can, it can sort of function as the negative space of, I mean, certainly of the hero myth, right? Like in order to create the hero, you need some kind of, some kind of quest, right? Some kind of adversity. And sometimes it's a journey, but a lot of the time it's killing a monster. And so what that means functionally is that all of these monsters essentially existed in order to be acted upon by men and thereby turn them into heroes, right? Which is like something that I think women and people who who are feminized or who are treated as women like have st like still experience that and, and relate to that, right? That like you are essentially a, a catalyst for the guy who is at the center um, and who is the important one. I, I, I said the other day, I said something like, you know, manic monster dream girl, right? Like they, they exist to, to turn him into a hero. Um, in the way that kind of the Manic Pixie Dream Girl exists to turn the male um, protagonist into kind of a fully realized person. Um, and, and yeah, I mean that, and, but that does get sidelined if you're, if you're thinking about, you know, mythology and just sort of the, the history of storytelling and story making in this very, you know, singular, like there can't be a monomyth because there's too many kinds of people you know, um, but but it's very, very easy to tell yourself that there is only one kind of story if you think that only one kind of people counts. So. Yes, that is it. I'm going to hold on to that for the next time I have that conversation with this guy. That is a, a good, like, shut you down. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we only have a couple of minutes before we turn this over to Q&A. So I want to remind everybody that you can pop questions over in the Q&A box. I think one or two of you might have Put them in chat but if you put them in q a we will be sure to see them and hopefully just can get to them but before we turn it over to your questions i have um just one more thing that i want us to touch on which is um the idea of the physicality of this book and i know we talked about this a little bit earlier and, and you rejected the idea of mine that this is a very physical feeling book um but I found it to be an intensely body oriented collection of essays. And I think some of that might be inherent to the fact that the story of many of these monsters, monstrousness is about their body changing, that they go from being a normal human woman to having some aspect of monstrousness imposed upon them um, and kind of coping with the fact that they now inhabit this body or being observed as a monstrous form without any of the people who gaze upon them having any conception of them having an interior life. Um, and by extension, you know, when you when you bring these monsters into other areas of philosophy, of politics, of your life, of the life of sort of the general world that these essays inhabit, you write really beautifully and evocatively and concretely about human bodies, whether it's your own or bodies in general. And I'm thinking specifically that incredible passage where you describe the anatomical Venus or the series of anatomical Venuses at um, the, what is it, the Josephinium um, yeah. in, in Vienna. Um, and I would love to know for you what the, the sort of process of writing about bodies is like and if it is connected to or distinct from writing about peopled bodies, like bodies that have persons inside of them. Um, I mean, it's it's really to me it's fascinating that that's kind of the experience that you have with books. I under like I understand, but I also like to me I often feel like all I'm trying to do, and I actually read about that this in one of the the essays. But like all I'm trying to do is just be a brain in a jar, 
And so it's possible that like the reason that bodies show up in this book so much is that they are a problem. They're like a capital T problem for me and also for these monsters. Cause as you know, like for a lot of them, like there's no real reason that they have to be a monster except that they're part woman and part animal. Like that, that is kind of the, that's the requirement. That's what, you don't have to do anything. Um, and so there is like a real, um, sense that the thing that conveys monstrousness often is not a behavior, it's only a particular form of embodiment that there isn't necessarily anything wrong with in and of itself, but just, you know, it's non-standard and people go, oh my god, it's a bird woman um, with a womb obscene, at, like, who otherwise did absolutely fucking nothing to me, but she's a bird woman and she smells, you know, like that's, there is a lot of that in these stories. Um, and I mean, the re so the reason you you asked me earlier, you said, I wanna talk about what a physical book it is. And, and I thought that was so funny because like when I talk to people who have more writing training than me, they're often saying like, oh, you should put more scenes in here. Like you should you should create a scene, you should like set the scene. And, uh, and my friend who is also your friend, Helena Fitzgerald and I are in the same writing group and we're bo always both like scenes. Um, <laughs> I think she thinks of herself as writing about feelings and I think of myself as writing about thoughts and neither of us like really want to then have to like describe the room um yeah. and but I guess I, I mean I guess that in a sense if you're talking about living in a body you're describing you're describing the room all the time right just the the very very small and specific room um that you are trapped within um but so yeah, I think insofar as like bodies are are a theme and 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 they definitely are, it's uh it's kind of it comes from a place of kind of resisting that and being like, okay, well, no matter how much you resist embodiment, it does continually come back. Like you can't actually get rid of it. <laughs> Fucking personhood, right? Like the futility of a perfect dualism. Yeah. Yeah. Um uh, so like, so I didn't think of myself as kind of like, I think of myself as being kind of dealing with ideas and stories and like resonances and metaphors and stuff like that. So it's actually like kind of a relief to hear that it felt physical at times because I do kind of resist setting those scenes. I'm like, that's for, that's for real writers. <laughs> <laughs> I too hate scenes. I hate scenes so much. Why, why, why do you need a scene? I just, I have thoughts. That's enough. Right. I mean, I love to, I love to read that. Um, I love to read a scene. Oh, sure. And, and like, and I totally understand why you know people people who like write you know features. It's like which I, and actually you do this really well. That to, I do like, this because my editors it. force me to add scenes. Right. Exactly because people make you and you know that like you have to ask what the dog's name is and like add all these details and stuff like that. And I'm just kind of like like oh can I connect the etymology of this word to like. <laughs> You would absolutely ask what the dog's name is, but just you wouldn't do it journalistically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I would just, yeah, I would just want to know what the dog's name is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, okay, well, we have reached the portion of the evening where we're going to um, open things up to Q&A. So it looks like we've got some really great questions um, populating the Q&A box. I think only Jess and I can see them. So if you have a question and you want to make sure it gets answered, please drop it in there. And uh, I see a couple of repeated questions, so I'll prioritize those. So, like, you know, you can cast your, I don't know, anonymous ballot by asking your question and hoping other people ask it too. So we can start with the big one, which a whole bunch of folks have asked, which is, um, and this is from several people, Caitlin, Emily, a couple people who I could scroll down and get the names of. Um, were there any monsters who didn't make the cut for the final book that you thought were particularly interesting? That's a really good question. So in terms of, so I, I was kind of limiting myself to Greek mythology and the reason, and I kind of get into this in, in the introduction, um, but the reason for this is what I was talking about earlier, that just the like gravity that these myths ex exert on the culture that has fought, worked very hard to dominate all other cultures. Um, and sort of the one that we're stuck with in many ways. Um, and so that's the one that I want to interrogate um, because you know I think it's the one that's that's been really like kind of putting its elbow in on everybody. Um, 
there are there are so many good female monsters that are that are outside of that culture and that are outside of like a culture that I necessarily want to comment on because I'm coming in as an outsider and I don't want to be like, hey, you're sexist. Um, and they aren't necessarily sexist. They're they're you know they're they're portraying women monsters in different ways. Um, but uh, but like man, Japanese culture has some amazing female monsters and ghosts, um, which. Aoko Matsuda writes about really, really beautifully. Um, I read a book by Charlene Teo called Ponty, which is not really about the Pontianac, but it, it but it kind of is, um, which is which is a Southeast Asian monster. Um, and Jamie Nakamura Lin is doing uh, an East Asian monster series on catapult. So there are some really wonderful ones that are just from sort of outside the the Greek ambit. Um, from within the Greek ambit, there's not a lot. There's the there's the three like gray sisters who have one eyeball and one tooth that they share between them. Um, and that I was sort of interested in doing, but that was a situation where I was like, okay, I, I'm not sure what um, what kind of metaphorical value this holds. And so maybe I'll maybe I'll hold that back and just do like a standalone essay on that. Um, I've always but, found them to be just so epically creepy. Of all of the monsters, there's something about the shared eyeball. Though my particular like body horror nightmare is anything involving eyeballs. So, you know. I mean, it would yeah, but I don't think I don't know if I could do a whole essay on creepiness. Maybe I could. <laughs> they're uh, also a pretty decent one for like aging, though. Oh, that was yeah, that was sort of my initial plan, and then that that didn't end up making the cut. Um, and I also like I wish I could have written about Baba Yaga, but she's from a totally different um, tradition. But I feel like that that's she's a fascinating character. Um, because she's she's like so morally ambiguous and in some stories is good and in some stories is evil and I get a big kick out of that so very cool I want the Baba Yaga book that's yeah please yeah. do an entire book on Baba Yaga <laughs> um the next question we're gonna ask comes from Annalie and it's a fantastic one um can you talk a little bit about the connection between monstrosity and sexual desire or to put it yeah. another way, how does the monsterification of women relate to erotic objectification? Yeah, um, so that that winds up coming up in a couple of these essays uh, in different ways, um, just kind of from different angles. And and it kind of you know, in general, I think the the thing that defines monstrosity the way that that I'm sort of engaging with it in the book is a kind of too muchness, right? The idea of overflowing boundaries and the idea that uh, for women and um, for women and feminized people specifically, those boundaries are so strict that it's like very, very easy to overflow. Um, and so obviously, like, right, obviously this is going to happen with sexual desire. It's also going to happen with lack of sexual desire, right? So one of the things that I end up talking about um, with the sirens, this isn't really about lack of sexual desire, but like the sirens, essentially what they're representing within the story is seduction and temptation that is unfulfilled, right? And so, so what's kind of evil and monstrous and too much about them is that they are, they are I, I think I said uh, in the book that men use their bodies to make, them, make a promise to themselves um, and which, which then they're not necessarily fulfilling. Um, so, there, so there's that, there's like, there's the idea of, you know, I sort of deal with the idea of hunger and Charybdis, the whirlpool. And so there's, you know, there's physical hunger, there's emotional hunger, there's also sexual hunger. Um, and all of these are things that uh, for women are supposed to be very circumscribed. If they're not circumscribed, if you put a foot out of line, that's where the monstrosity comes in. Um, and then also just in dealing uh, with the body, um, you know, the, the kind of, uh, projections that are made onto feminized bodies that the expectations of um, you know a certain kind of uh, what's so like a, like a certain kind of um, flawlessness right um, and also a certain kind of like uncomplicatedness um, and so like when like when these bodies then persist in being overly human, then that's something that kind of overflows and becomes monstrous, right? If they're too smelly or too hairy or too, you know, that's not the, the genitals that I expected to see or whatever, like these are the places that, um, that people get, uh, that, that like monstrousness is imposed on people. That um, again reminds me of the, the vignette with the anatomical venuses that you 
that you talk about in the book. And I, maybe you can explain that for anyone who hasn't, who isn't familiar with the phenomenon of anatomical venuses or hasn't read that section of the book. I found it to be just brain exploding. Yeah. Um, so the, the anatomical venus is a, a Renaissance um, sort of anatomical artwork. Um, there, there are several of them. They, they, most of them came out of this one particular shop in Italy. Um, but they are a life-size, very beautiful woman who is, she's lying down. She's often like wearing jewelry or something. She looks sort of very serene. Sometimes she's wearing like a little crown. Um, and then either she's just kind of, so they're made out of wax. They're not, they're not real people. Um, either she's just kind of flayed open in the torso or in some cases her torso lifts off um, and you, you sort of pick it up and then you can look in and see the, the organs and sometimes there's like a fetus in there. Um, and so, and, but they were, they were made specifically to kind of trouble the boundaries, I think, between beauty and death, but people objected to them for the same reasons um, that, that this, this uh, um, collapsing of, of the, like the sort of raw physicality of having organs and having anatomy with this sort of like serene, you know, they're wearing a pearl necklace, they've got like long hair, they look like Sleeping Beauty. Um, so that was, that was one of the things that I looked at was sort of the, the reception history, essentially of the anatomical venus, like where they, where they came from and then also why, why people might have objected to them. Not to out myself as too terminally online, but it reminds me a lot of this, um, incredible Tumblr phenomenon that you're probably familiar with called Alexandria's Genesis, which was like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. So this was this, um, this, I guess at the time she was probably like an adolescent, like 13 or 14, this Tumblr user many, many years ago wrote this series of posts that wound up going hugely viral and people believed them to be true. Like Tumblr users thought that there was an actual chromosomal mutation called Alexandria's Genesis that would cause women to have purple eyes, completely hairless bodies from the eyebrows down, um, specifically no pubic hair. Um, they would never menstruate, but they would be able to be fertile. And like, it was this total, just like debodyification of the female body. Um, and many years later, the woman who kind of invented it and then it you know, became this whole meme, wrote a really lovely essay kind of reflecting on how she created this because she was so in horror of her own kind of immediately post pubescent body. Um, and there is such, I think, a deep connection between sort of sexual maturity, voraciousness, the squickiness of being a person, like of, of physicality and, and kind of casting as monstrous all of those attributes. Yeah, yeah I, I mean, you didn't talk. know about that. I know, <laughs> I know. I, wow. In some ways, it's like I like post my like I skipped over Tumblr in a lot of ways. Like I was very <laughs> online with Tumblr, and I guess I would say that I'm very online now. But um, but now I want to. If I had known about that, I probably would have worked it in. Honestly, because <laughs> um, yeah, like we talk about the objectification of female bodies, but we don't necessarily talk about the fact that like that that is like literally turning them into an object a lot of the time. You know, like not actually not actually a body, not actually something with any humanity. You know, and I think of like. The, the figures in the Corova milk bar in Clockwork Orange, right? Like that's, that's kind of what we're supposed to be aspiring to. They're literally made out of plaster. Yeah, just pure objects. Um, so I think we have time for probably one more question. Um, oh, this is a really wonderful one from Virginia. How do you think about the women in Greek mythology who weren't turned into formidable monsters, but who were still punished for their run-ins with gods? Um, like being turned into unthreatening animals and plants and things like that. Yeah, um, there, there is also a really beautiful um, book that came out, uh, I think two years ago, which for a minute I was like, oh no, this is gonna scoop me. It's doing the same thing as me, um, but it's not, it's doing it in a different way. And it's really wonderful um, called Wake Siren, which kind of re-inscribes in a similar way the women from Ovid. Um, and it is, it is sort of fascinating that, you know, Ovid has this whole, you know, the metamorphoses, it's a, it's a big tome and it's not all women turning into shit, but it, I mean, it's all people turning into shit. It's, it's mostly women turning into shit. 
even the men who turn into shit often are like men who are being put in this sort of feminized position um, where you know they're they're playing out the same story um, and so there there is a like a larger than the monster tradition tradition of you know women turning into trees um, turning into flowers turning into you know a voiceless echo um, and I'm, I'm very like I'm very very glad that somebody took on more of those um, than I had sort of the scope for in this book. Um, but, you know, in, in, in some ways it's all of a piece um, because it is, you know, sort of inscribing the female body as something that is acted upon. Um, but, uh, but on the other hand, like, I think one of the things that's interesting about some of the women who like get turned into trees or reeds or whatever is some of them do it defensively. Um, so that's also really interesting, right? Is that sometimes they're like being pursued and it's easier to be turned, to turn themselves into a tree um, than, to, than to escape essentially. Um, so I guess, I guess my, if there's a, a sort of overarching answer to this question, it's that there's a lot more to be said about that. Um, <laughs> but, there, but it's definitely, I think it can be kind of two parts of a similar um, way that women's bodies are used in these stories. Yeah, I remember in my childhood readings of Delores absolutely not understanding why. Was it Laurel who turns herself into a Laurel because she doesn't want Apollo to catch her? And they were yeah. always very circumspect about the fact that like Apollo was chasing her to have sex with her or to rape her. And like I, you know, was like seven years old and had no idea. I was like, why doesn't she just play with him? Why become a tree? Like there's so many of these that are so sinister once you outgrow Delores, because one of the ones that's in Delaire's a lot of them aren't like like Mura is in um, the Metamorphoses and she turns into a tree because she wants to have sex with her father. So like the the, the Dolores didn't want to touch that one, um, but they do have Pan and Syrinx and Syrinx turns into reeds for the same reason that she's running away and she's trying to escape. And then Pan takes and you know and it's Pan which when you're not when you're not a child you're like oh there's like this is this is absolutely a horniness situation. And then he takes the reeds and he makes them into a Pan pipe. So he's like playing on this instrument that is made of her body that she made of the thing that she turned her body into to escape him which is so sinister um so it is, <laughs> it is growing out of Dolores and then going back to it is a wild experience the business of becoming an adult it's like horrible you learn all of this terrible stuff all, all of these stories own. that imprinted <laughs> so much worse it's all just like terminally horny demigods and the women trying to escape them terminally oh. horny demigods and the women who love them or don't <laughs> or hate them. <laughs>